Hi, uh, my name is Alicia Cordes. I'm uh, the founder and president of a nonprofit called Reclaim Community in Southwest Minnesota, just a few miles from the um, south or south of Minnesota, next to South Dakota, uh, about three miles. And um, we're going to be talking today about Sioux Quartzite, which is one of the featured ge um, geology in our area, and one of the reasons we are, um, you know, doing everything that we're doing for preservation for some fairly unique structures. So, um, hopefully, you'll learn a lot, and we have a lot to share with you. My name is Mike Lovato. I am a historical architect with LHB, and I have had the pleasure of working on several buildings uh, made of Sioux Quartzite in Pipestone County, and two of the uh, you know, most significant ones were here with Alicia and her organization, Reclaim Community. Uh, Got to say, I'm used to you know doing these in sold-out football stadiums and, uh, and uh, uh, soccer stadiums, so this is very intimate. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so just just so you know where we're at, uh, we are way down in the bottom left-hand corner of the state and that big, sorry if I just oh, shot you in the eyes, but <laughs> uh, bottom uh, left-hand corner of the state and that is Pipestone County and that big yellow blob down there is the Sioux Quartzite Basin. And when you uh, think about it, it makes sense that most of the historic buildings down there are made out of Sioux Quartzite because it's you're basically in the Great Plains at that point and there is not a lot of trees and a lot of rocks. So, so that's that's uh, where you get the Sioux Quartzite from. Uh, and Alicia's gonna talk a little bit about the, their stone itself. All right, so um, you can see here, I've got some pictures to start with to talk about the Jasper Stone Company. So of course, the one of the most interesting things about this community to me is that it was named incorrectly. <laughs> These settlers showed up in the 1850s, 1860s, 1880s, and the town was actually founded in 1881 or incorporated. And um, they, they thought, oh, this look at this Jasper stone, this granite, because it kind of looked like it. It felt similar, looked similar, you know, in the best visual um, glances. And there were some people who came through and like um, studied the Pipestone Monument, like Catlin, I was named for George Catlin, things like that. So there was people who were to looking at this stuff and examining it, but they hadn't had laboratory testing. And so they named it Jasper because, and one of the things that I, I first found was the the mentor that I had who was 90 when I met her and was the Historical Society Director was talked about how Jasper was mentioned in the Bible and that's how why it was such an important thing. And um, even her having studied the history kind of didn't really always understand the difference between the stones and the metamorphic versus igneous rocks. So we've had to clear up a lot of misconceptions. So anyway, so to say that I just think it's kind of a funny thing that Sioux Quartzite went really, so the town is named Jasper when it was kind of silly. So uh, anyway, you can see the, the quarry here. And um, so the five Ray brothers from Scotland came to um, start this quarry and they imported, brought over a lot of Swedish stone cutters. So most of this, the, they call them Swedes around town. They'll just say, oh, those Swedes, you know, the stone cutters. So that's kind of how they were referred to. Not all of them were Swedish. Some of them were Irish or Scottish, and but the vast majority of them were very skilled um, Swedish stone cutters. And so um, what they do at the quarries here is they would, you could kind of see in the middle here, they have um, blast with dynamite. And then when they get these large chunks out called dimensional stone, they will um, drive wedges into it and they will split it along seam lines. And they they watch like how the sedimentary rock was deposited um, because Sioux Quartzite is actually made of silica, 95% silica, the bed of an alluvial plain. And uh, I'm gonna go to some next, next slides here. And um, it's between 1.6 to 1.7 billion years old. Um, these silica deposits were brought from a, a long ancient mountain range that's long eroded before this was a continent. So um, before, like when Pangea, if you've heard of that idea of the continent, um, when things were shifting and moving, um, this was, we were located in a different area. Minnesota was not where Minnesota is. And so it's, you know, billions, of, two billions of years old. And these deposits came down from a river and uh, sand and silica was fused over a long period of time by heat pressure, all that stuff. So it's metamorphic rock. Um, we've had a lot of people who believed that for a while that the, the, moons you see it in the particular stone that comes from jasper was because it was lava rock and those were bubbles and, and that we had to clear up a lot of misconceptions that that's not actually the case those are completely different kinds of rock so we've been working with a geologist from usd who is really adamant and loves sioux quartzite is fascinated by it and so she and her husband are very um helpful and they've been developing a tour with us so we've gotten a lot of great information so um that's then between 250,000 to 12,000 years ago, of course, the glacier dance in Minnesota, we all know that, and it pulled back a lot of the earth and exposed this bedrock. So this is the bedrock, which could be the bedrock under a large portion of it. So we really don't know, but we know the 40 mile-ish band that we think it's in and where it ex is exposed. 
And so um, it's very hard. It's 7.5 on the Mohs scale, which is just under diamonds. And so it is actually used to tumble and to polish other stones like diamonds in tumblers. So that's one of the major um, exports for it. Um, it. Catlinite, which is found in between the pipestone, is actually at 2.5. So that shows you how interesting it is to have different sediments that are layered together of such different um, strengths. And so um, the pink moons that you'll see, um, my daughter actually in that picture is pointing them out. <laughs> um, and, and that's a big dimensional stone block in, in Sioux Falls. And so those are only known to come from the Jasper Stone Company quarry. That's the only one that we know that those come out of. So if you see these moons anywhere in the Midwest on a quartzite building, it came from the Jasper Stone Company. And there are a lot of the different um, quarries have di slightly different characteristics, even though it's generally all pinkish, reddish, but there's slightly different compositions, slightly different sedimentary lines and layers and formations and things. And so um, Jasper Stone Company right now is the only dimensional, domains, dimensional stone quarry that's open. The rest of them have all closed um, long ago because most of the what they do now is crushing rock, monuments, um, and they do some smaller stuff, but that's the vast majority of it. And so the coolest thing that the um, geologists told us is that when we we had a lot of questions about the pink moons and that was something nobody really knew. So what that actually is, is this is a record of the oxygenation of the atmosphere because between 1.6 to 1.7, even maybe 2 billion years ago, ago all that silica is 95% silica and there's 5% iron oxide and that's what gives it the pink color. And so that pink color on the, in those stones, um, what robs iron? Your respiration, your blood, you need iron to breathe in your blood. So that is one of the first signs that there was some kind of um, first life form there and that it was using like a cell, a, a, a bacterium of some sort or something, and a life form was using that iron oxide for its first respiration. So that's how old and significant the stone is, and that's part of the reason why we were really excited about it and think it's so interesting. <laughs> so um, here's some examples of it in Pipestone Rock County. Um, Pipe Jasper is actually right on the border. Part of the town is in Rock, part of the town is in Pipestone. And so this is right um, a couple miles away, three miles away in Island State Park, and there was a quarry there. And they, these um, dam and the Stone Arch Bridge are um, both on the National Register, and I um, considered a feat of engineering because of the skill of the stone cutters. And um, the mentor I had from Jasper, her uncle was a quarry master there, and he said that the trimming that they did at the quarry because they would they would trim out all the stones, cut them to to fit exactly the way they were, number them, and then they would take them to the building site and then rebuild them there, and then do a final trimming and finishing there. And when they laid that very keystone in that bridge, he said there was barely any trimming that needed to be done. It was done so well and it finished in 1938, started in 1936. So um, the cool thing about this, I really love to tell this little story. In 1993, the dam washed out. And uh, one of the funnest, funniest part about that is these quarry workers, there's 40 to 60 of them usually on the crew in the early 1900s. And now there's only eight that work there, but um, they were building a lot of stuff for the WPA. And so um, they got knocked in the middle of the night after the rain got was torrential. And one of the dudes who worked at the quarry, um, somebody came and woke him up and said, the dam's, the dam broke, the dam broke. And he said, I built, I worked on that dam. He was like in his seventies at that point. I worked on the dam. It's not going anywhere. Rolled over and went back to bed. He was right. The dam didn't break. The dirt around the dam broke. That Sioux Court site didn't go anywhere, <laughs> even after 70, 80 years of being laid. And so um, what they did is when they fixed it um, in this next, or maybe I don't have, I, I thought I had another picture of it. Um, or the previous picture there. You can see um, if you look on the very left-hand side where you see the, the the very left picture, the right-hand side, you can kind of see a little bit of quartzite that kind of comes out, but it's not part of the dam. That's where they put quartzite over top of where it had originally washed out the dirt to pre prevent that from happening again. So um, kind of a cool story. Anyway, here, so here's just some basic pictures of Jasper's Main Street. You can see some of the stone buildings in there. Um, the one in the center of the kitty corner is directly across from the building that we, one of the buildings we're working on. But it used to be two um, or four full blocks of um, uh, businesses and lots of quartzite, some wood structures in between. And a lot of the wood ones, of course, have gone and we don't have a lot left. So um, I'll turn this over and he'll talk about some of the rest of the buildings in Pipestone County. So... Uh... One of the reasons that I want, or a couple of the reasons that I wanted to do this presentation today is one, give Alicia a chance to do, talk about the great work that her organization, Reclaimed Community, is doing, but also just to highlight uh, this really unique architectural uh, resource down there in Pipestone County. I have been, since I've been in Minnesota now five years, I've been to a lot of very, very charming historical uh, towns. And because of the prevalence of this, this stone there, I, you know, when you get into Pipestone or when you get into Jasper, you know you're in somewhere special. You don't have to be an architectural historian to understand that you know this is this is a unique place and there is something that unifies 
these towns that, that not a lot of other towns have. And, and because it is such, such a remote corner of the, the state, I don't think a lot of people realize what a unique architectural resource it is. So I just wanted to highlight that here today. Uh, for my organization, to, to he, he's not wrong in the sense that um, he, for, from coming as a visitor and seeing it, what we actually hear is I hear people say, oh, Jasper, I was just there. I drove through there to look at, we were we had a uh, couple hours on the way to a ball game and we drove through there to look at the buildings. I hear it all the time, but the townspeople don't hear it. I hear it because I go around and I talk about my town and people go, oh, I heard of Jasper. I've seen the buildings there, but nobody in town knows that that's happening. And so it's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. So, so these are the buildings that I have had the pleasure on work, uh, and LHB have had the pleasure of working on. Uh, started in 2019 with the Pipestone uh, Carnegie Library there. Uh, we got a, and I will say all of these uh, buildings have received uh, much of the funding from the Minnesota Historical Society. So none of this would be possible without funding from them. So I should shout out them real quick. But so we did, we started there at the Carnegie Library, um, did a condition assessment. Uh, pointed out areas of concern, and then a year later, uh, got a call from the city manager that it was falling apart. And uh, so preservation comes at you fast is going to be a theme of this talk. Uh, so we went down and did some uh, quick re uh, restoration drawings for them, and, and they applied for the grant. Unfortunately, they didn't get that grant that year, and they sort of infilled the spot with a, uh, some framing, and I, I'm not entirely sure what's happening with that building, but it, I think they tried to sell it, and it's still up in the air. But uh, the Ferris Grand Block below that is also in Pipestone, and that was built as an opera house in 1899, I think. And then in 1916, uh, the Masons bought it and had it for about 100 years until they sold it to the Pipestone uh, County Historical Society, who worked with the organization that is now called Rethos, and they did a really nice historic structures report for that. And we were hired in 2020 to come and do uh, design documents for some of the high priority items there, which included... Uh, you know, masonry restoration on the facade and the sides, uh, new roof and uh, structural uh, upgrades in the basement. Uh, right now we are nearing, almost nearing completion with the first of what is probably going to be many phases of work uh, in completing the facade restoration. So, and then moving from there over to uh, Jasper, we uh, currently are just wrapping up the first draft for a historic structures report and our uh, condition assessment for the poor Bob block up there in the top right, which is uh, which was built as a just general uh, commercial building on their main street, but served as their uh, printing office for the new local newspaper from like 1917 to 1972 when it moved out of the building. So there's still big printing presses in the basement, which is really quite neat. And then the other two are Bauman Hall, uh, also in Jasper, and the Jasper School, which are two that are owned by uh, Reclaim Community that we'll talk about a bit more here. Uh, and I, I really like this photo just because you can see, even though this is all Suport site and it's all sort of geologically similar, you know, you could really get the, the difference in the quality of and color of the stone, depending on where it was quarried. The Pipestone buildings, and that's pretty typical of the buildings in Pipestone, are, are sort of a deeper red. And then the Jasper buildings like Porba and the Jasper School are, are sort of a light pink or a mauve. And then the interesting thing about Bauman is it was, uh, even though it's in Jasper, it was moved there block by block from another now no longer extant community called North Sioux Falls. And uh, it's sort of got a, almost an orange hue to it. So really get a nice variation. And obviously they use different stones from different uh, quarries to have you know, architectural uh, details and features. Uh, and just to sort of give you a sense of, of you know, the impact these buildings have on you when you go into these communities. I've highlighted the two buildings that uh, we've worked on there, but also every other uh, one of these red bobs is a, is a building that's made entirely out of Sioux Port site. So, you know, you, it really has a profound effect on you when you're in these communities. Uh, and then these are what some of the other buildings look like in Pipestone. Uh, and then there are many more that we did not include in this slide. But, um, and here's Jasper. And as you can see, you know, Sioux Quartzite still makes up a lot of the, the buildings there that are there as well. You can see the quarry that's still in operation down there at the bottom of the screen. And some of those, uh, you can see a little bit, a little bit more modest, and, uh, but also nice and, and very unified in their design. Uh, we'll say another uh, preservation comes at you fast moment. This, this one is a privately owned uh, saloon here. And I think a couple of years ago, they had a bunch of uh, stone fall off of that and sort of crush the awning there and not, you know, just put some sheet metal back up there and uh, there it, it is today. So 
one of the themes that I want to get across is, is this is a remarkable architectural resource, but it is literally crumbling under its own weight. So want to highlight it and, and sort of have a call to action about um, doing you know, doing what we can down there to make sure this doesn't go away. Because like Alicia said, I mean, it's it's one of the hardest stones on the planet. And I on all the buildings I've looked at, I haven't seen a single stone that is deteriorating from nature, but it's the mortar and the mortar dissolves and they just sort of fall apart. And it's such heavy and expensive work to do that it, it's hard to convince people that it's worth undertaking. Um, just a little bit of uh, showing the sort of um, extent of where this stone has gone to. I think the first major project from the Jasper Quarry there is at Calvary Cathedral in Sioux Falls. Uh, you have the Brewster Apartments in Chicago, Illinois, which is a big, beautiful uh, Sioux Fort site building. Uh, the Van Dusen House in Minneapolis and the WH Leitner House in St. Paul, all using Sioux Fort site from Jasper. So I'll let uh, Alicia talk a little bit more about her. Okay, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about how we, how and why we got started here. Um, so if you can see here, I grew up in Jasper. Um, my grandparents actually homesteaded there. My grand grandfather built a farmhouse about six miles west of Jasper, and I grew up on a farm a mile west of that that my grandpa bought. And <laughs> actually, before the bank crashed, the, the, the story is he had a dream. He was laying on the couch and he had a dream the bank was going to crash. He was going to lose all his money, so went up, went through everything but three hundred bucks, bought a farm that was up for tax forfeiture, and he lost the three hundred bucks he left in the bank, but he had the farm. <laughs> so that's basically where I grew up. And so um, my family actually went through the farm crisis. So a lot of people might remember like this rural areas like Jasper were very, very impoverished. And there was a lot of um, suicides. There was a lot of um, failures and bankruptcies at this time. My parents actually did go through bankruptcy and reorganize. And so the first picture we were featured in the paper because we were one of the families that a church from um, New York had given us Christmas gifts because we couldn't afford Christmas gifts that year. And my mom fixed up old buggy frames in the gr um, the barn and my dad painted an old sled for us. And so, um, and then the second picture was at 13, they did it, revisited our family because my parents had both graduated from college doing night classes with five kids. And it was just like kind of an interesting story. And my mom became a teacher at the school. So the school was kind of a second home for me. I grew up in kind of a rough, you know, poor home. And so it was, it was an escape. It was getaway. It was beautiful. It was hardwood floors, huge windows with lights that were like just open light. It was very warm and inviting with small classes, 17 to 25 kids. And so it's K through 12 in one building. And so this is a picture of my last year. I was there in 1993 when they CNC'd with um, Pipestone, the neighboring district, and basically all the high school went and elementary stayed in Jasper and they mothballed the top two levels of this school. So that's my picture of my mom too. She was a special ed teacher and her room was actually the very center, kind of I call it like the crow's nest building in the very center. So it was fun to sit up there and sit in front of her huge windows and look down and watch all the kids on the lawn. <laughs> so um, slides here. And so here, here's actually what the building looks like. Um, another view of it. This is straight from the street with um, in the fall, obviously, because it's hard to see it because there's so many trees and it's park-like. So it's a very beautiful, but it's once it's hard to even photograph because it's such a massive building with the trees. You can't even really get a good picture of it unless you go drive around it. So um, anyway, we started our organization in 2016. The first thing I did when I heard the school was coming up for auction on tax forfeiture, it had been abandoned since about 2000 and seven um the owner had owned it for a few years he tried to put a mock apartment in it had some tours and then things kind of fell apart he um had difficulty finding funding he was elderly he and his wife got ill and it was abandoned for about seven or eight years it was listed i think in 2007 by rethos as one of the top 10 endangered buildings in the state with the pipestone high school and both of them were sold to the same person so they both ended up in dilapidated rundown states and so um this one we actually saved in 2016 when they auctioned it off um, I held a community meeting to kind of propose why I thought it was worth it, had done some research on the economics and stuff. And so I called, I had a call to action and uh, um, they extended the auction a week to get us to bid that we beat out another bidder. It was $17,000 worth of back taxes. <laughs> and so we um, bid uh, 25,000 to beat the other bidder and bought the school. <laughs> and um, we sent out a, le a letter to alumni. That was the first thing we did because we have an active court center club and every three years they have a um, reunion still, even though the school like the last graduating class was in 93. So um, anyway, we had about 1,500 alumni. We hand wrote a mailer, licked the stamps, everything, like mailed it all out and had a fundraiser, pancake feed in. That was in December where we signed the purchase agreement with $4,000 we had raised. I had to have the rest um, by Valentine's Day to close. So that, uh, January 31st, we had a pancake breakfast, actually happened to be on my birthday, which was funny. And we raised $6,000 that day. And then we kept getting checks in the mail and we kept going, there's more money coming. There's more money coming. And by the time Valentine's Day came, we had $40,000 instead of 25. And so we thought, 
okay, I think this is, we're going to do this. And so um, we end up went through this process of incorporation and then um, didn't close actually until like May. So we had more time because of probate and long story. But anyway, so that kind of shows you the expense that we invested in it. And then um, we actually worked with Rethos to get, ha get this to happen really fast. The whole reason that we were able to do that is because I contacted Preservation Alliance at, that, at the time they were called that because I was searching and I thought, oh my gosh, they have this fiscal sponsorship. We were able to take tax deductible donations just immediately, which made it more likely that we we're going to get more donations up front and people, you know, could, could invest in it. And so, um, that was a huge thing for us, um, to have them help us get started. And so, um, then we, the first thing we did in 2018, we had raised about, that was a, a, a year they had a, a big all school reunion. So we knew it was going to be a huge summer event. So we raised about $9,000 at our fundraisers that whole summer. And we ended up taking off six roll off dumpsters of just garbage, waste, trash, moldy finishes and stuff. And so we had it evaluated to find out that, um, we've done a lot of small projects like that, like $13,000 we raised one year to turn on the electricity because the owner had cut the wires to the building we had to put a new box in and all this stuff so there's been projects that we funded and, and put calls out and done fundraisers for and so um we did the, the ten thousand dollar grant for the national register and then um did the historic structure report which is seventy five thousand dollars and took about 18 months it was really wonderful we just finished that project with lhb and uh, we looked at the uh, cost of demolition was bonded out about eight hundred fifty thousand dollars in 2002 and it was actually saved by the historical society director at that time and then that's why they sold it so when we bought it um we had an estimated value of replacement for insurance was 30 to 35 million and a real estate agent has appraised it at 21 to 24 million after we finish it putting in about six to seven million in finishes to finish the entire building so that's kind of our projections that we're working with down here you can see my board um pretty much everyone except for our secretary was an alumni of the school um and so they jumped forward um our contractor on um, the red sweatshirt he was already caring for the building ahead of time and so that was really um important so here you can see some newspaper clippings and stuff that our mentor um, the historical society director had documented of the process and the letters she actually wrote um in 2002 saying to the historical site and saying, please help us. The school district wants to tear down this building. It is, I believe it's worth saving. And so she was um, really instrumental in that because by the time I came along in 2016 and I called her and said, I heard you were involved in saving this building. What can you tell me? Can you help me? She said, oh, bless your heart, dearie. I'm so tired. I've fought for that building so many times and I just, I just can't, but I wish you the best. And then two or three hours later, I got a call and she said, if you want to come down to Jasper, I have something for you. So I tootled the hour up to Jasper, went to her house, and she came out with a booklet, all like in sleeves, photocopies, like a 30-page booklet of a history on the school. And it, it typed out. And she had gone, gone down to the city office, had them photocopy it, put it in a binder, typed out a nameplate, like everything on her typewriter, and was like, here you go. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I think this is possible. <laughs> and so um, she thought it was a little crazy until she talked to me the first time. And she's like, I figured, I think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> So we became fast friends. She was a mentor of mine and unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but she was wonderful and did a lot of work. So um, it kind of gives you the rundown here. And then um, here are some interesting pictures we like to show of the first building. On the left-hand side, this is actually the building that doesn't exist anymore. That was only in service for like 10 or 12 years. And we aren't sure, but we believe that a lot of the stones and stuff they used in that building they used it when they tore it down and then built this next building, which is the original Jasper School built in 1911. So the, you could see the windows are different, things are different, but the structure isn't that much different. It's slightly bigger. And the reason they they did it was because they wanted to add it like at eight through 12 high school because they had increasing enrollment, more people moving to town, that kind of stuff. So then here's through the years. I'm um, actually, the first picture is from a newspaper clipping. Governor Eberhard actually came to the dedication because the residents asked him to come because it was supposed to be this like amazing school and this big feat of engineering and so he actually did come to the dedication um i like to show these pictures because this shows the the drawing plans from the 1939 edition um, which is really beautiful artwork and up up in the right hand corner i love to show that because that's what the windows used to look like um when i went to school there they were just single pane um three strips they didn't have all those dividers in them anymore because they'd been replaced at some point but um they were still lots of light very beautiful two or three windows in every room so here you can see kind of the exterior of the building um, and the front is in the bottom right and then the back kind of gymnasium on the top corner. And then from the other side, you can kind of see the back of the very newest edition, which unfortunately was not faced in Sukhort site to save money. <laughs> um, so here's some pictures of us doing some of the work when we first found the building. Like I said, the kitchen, the lower level, it's stone. There's condensation. It was not heated for like seven or eight years. There was moisture everywhere, mildew. And so we removed moldy drywall finishes, all the stuff that was put in that was not historic. And so um, the gym, you can see when we found the gym, like that's what it looked like. It, it is in remarkably good condition for having been abandoned that long. 
Um, one of the cool parts is this is the lower level basement where the cafeteria was when I went to school here. And you could see on the right and left top, that's where the drywall and paneling from the 80s was put in. We got rid of that right away because it was awful down there. The humidity was like 85%. Um, we put dehumidifiers in right away and dropped it to like 55, 60, and it just amazingly changed it. So we took all that out, and you can see we uncovered some murals from the 70s that people had forgotten were even there. I had no idea were there. So that was fun. Um, here you can kind of see one of the hallways with the lockers and the little alcove with the the um, water fountain, which is really neat. Um, so a few of the water fountains have been vandalized and broken, but most of them are still there. Um, on the lower picture, that's one of the first priorities when we have got this building. That locker room roof had already collapsed under the weight of a heavy snow. It's only a single um, layer, and so our contractor, he had already been in the building and because he had keys from the previous owner and stuff and had caretaken it, and he put those beams in and stuff, and then we patched the roof. And so um, you can see, too, here, in the gymnasium, they used to have um, glass block windows, and you can see them from the exterior, but you can't see them inside because they covered them up in the 60s when they lost their seal. So kind of an interesting way where we sometimes hide cool historic features and we hope to bring it, open them back up because the light that it provide naturally would just save so much on energy bills for a building of this size. Um, and so here a couple of years ago, we had a really bad flood in the building. Um, a crack opened up on the gym roof. And then we also had a drain elbow that get, got frozen because of the weight of ice and snow. There's about 18 inches of ice and snow that built up and it was freezing and thawing. So we had to go clear the drain and water was just pouring down in front of the stage. There's videos on our Facebook page. It was really kind of devastating, but we rigged up some plastic on the, the old curtain mechanisms because this was the kind of, we had a stage to the side, you know. And so we just got all the water off onto the concrete, shot vac, squeegeed it up and were able to keep the water off the floor, damaging it for the most part. And so we've done that strategically in a few areas where we've opened up some leaks and we haven't been able to get to like tracking where they're coming from. Cause sometimes it comes in weird places and some of the drains are actually in the walls of the building, which makes it very difficult. Um, so um, now I'm moving on to Bowman Hall. This is the next project that we went, went um, have been had done and we did this in 2018. This building came up for tax forfeiture uh, as well. Um, the mayor and the county and the city were talking, splitting the cost of demolition. We actually, because we wanted to know what that would cost, and we wanted to make the economic argument that was worth investment, that was going to cost $75,000. The ceiling tin in that building alone on the, the secondhand market would be worth at least 20 grand. We thought right there, that's a really dumb idea. So we, and this is the, one of the most unique buildings in town because it is a twice built building. It also was connected to the school, which is why my organization was interested. From 1908, when this building was built, uh, rebuilt, because it had been built in the 1880s at North Sioux Falls as a hotel for quarry workers, that quarry went defunct in the 1890s when Jasper Al grew it, and then they moved that building into town in 1907. It sat out there for years, and somebody bought it for 500 bucks and reconstructed it in town. So long story short, um, this building operated as a mercantile for most of its history. Um, in 1981 or 70, 77, it went to the historical society. They did discovered some issues with it in the wall further down. And they actually repaired that with an $80,000 grant from the Historical Society when we, they put it on the register then. So it was one page, pretty easy to do, which we were really grateful they did because that made it easier for us to save this building quickly. We sent a proposal to the auditor, said, this is what we're gonna do. These are the grants we're gonna try and get. This is the funding we have. And we've completed everything we said we were gonna do in three years. So um, when we, the stone was buckled when we bought it. Stone started falling up like less than a year after we bought it. So we knew we got it right in time. We bought it for $10,000, um, donations and a small loan from one of our uh, supporters. And then we got a $10,000 conditions assessment immediately to do shoring to make sure we could support the wall from the inside and make sure those stones didn't move while we were getting more plans done. So then we went on to do the grant for the architectural plans to design the shoring and the repair for the wall at the same time. And that was really key that LHB was able to do that for us because it saved us a lot of time and an extra grant round because we were able to incorporate those drawings in together. And so um, then we got uh, last year a grant for $173,000 uh, for repairing this wall. And so we just finished that and then um, are now being able to activate that building because we got a grant from the Department of Public Transformation. So we're gonna be using this for arts and historic trades because the best way to learn the trades and his historic trades is to work on a historic building. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. And so here's some pictures of an 81 when they got the grant. This is like, again, it's about 20 yards down the wall in a different area, but similar, you could same thing, it's the mortar and it's usually on the east sides of these buildings because the sun hits it, there's condensation. This is what happens in this building. So you'll see here when we bought it, the two pictures on the right, that's what ha was the interior of the wall because in the 80s, what they did, and that's the problem with these stone buildings is if you have a building that's not heated, there's no heat to push the water and the moisture out of the mortar and keep it from deteriorating. 
So the worst thing you can do for these buildings is just leave them alone. You have to have some kind of basic mothballing, keeping moisture out, keeping wind out, keeping snow out, and keep some sort of lower level heat in strategic areas, even if it's not the whole thing. So um, when we bought that building, all of the furring strips um, were so rotted because it had been put behind plaster and then or um, drywall and plastic that all the water just sat and con condensed behind there. And our, when our, there was a bubble in the wall and one of our volunteers went in and kind of punched it and then he backed up and he heard it creaking and that whole wall came down. So that was a very serious danger issue. So we had to put um, beams up in there and that's us cleaning up that part of the wall. And that's right below where all those beams are on the left that you can see because it was kind of pressing, or I guess it's a little to the side, but it was basically causing pressure, the weight of the roof on the floor and sagging the floor. And so it created all these problems. So we're trying to clean up that mess right now because that was like about 10, seven years of the city selling it very cheaply, just offload it because they didn't want to invest, you know, the thousands of dollars or get a grant or they were unsuccessful in a grant, I should say. And so then they just sold it off really quick. That person got it real cheap, didn't invest in it, bankruptcy, kind of that story that I'm sure a lot of you've heard. So here's why we thought it was so interesting because in the left-hand side, that is actually what the stage used to look like in the very first high school play was performed here. They used that second floor for a performing hall for the school because there was no place to put all of the graduates and all of their families at the same time. Um, the school is only big enough for the students. And so they had to use this for the graduations, plays, community things like they were talking about sitting to Mai in the church festivals. They did that here. There was a lot of Norwegians and Swedes here. And so they would have parties and all kinds of town gatherings happened on the second floor. So we thought this building was very important. And in the 1970s, when they sold this building, they actually um, auctioned off most of the things. But we do have the original drop cloth that, with all the advertisements that are printed on it from the 1930s that we could hang back one day. So um, here you go. You can see some of the way it looked when we bought it. Um, on the inside, we actually did get donated a grand piano. So we have that in there. And we're, that kind of area used to be the senior center kitchen in the back there. So we're hoping to put a little cafe area in there again and incubate some small businesses because we don't really have a coffee shop in Jasper or anything like that. Um, and then you can see the main commercial space up on the right hand side is one of my favorite that's on the second floor. There's a little ticket window when you come up the stairs to go into like for the dances or the events. And there's all of these written calculations in pencil of people calculating all the numbers of tickets in the coffins. <laughs> and so they were just using the walls as their um, scratch paper, which was kind of funny. So here you can see the process of the construction and the wall from the inside. We had to abate a little bit of that plaster up there. And so um, that's something we're discussing on how to continue that work without you know, keeping as much as historic, but also abating some things that we can't uh, keep. And so here's the lower level in the first room. That is the room that actually had the wall come down. You can see the, the beaming that we have in there and temporarily till we decide how to replace that interior structure of furring because the way they built these buildings that they embedded the um, wood strips in the wall. And that's, like I said, without having heat, those are gonna rot and deteriorate when you have that sun hitting the east wall and the moisture just condensing and it dropping down the inside of that stone all day. And so we're looking like moving these buildings into radiant heat is probably one of the best things you can do for a stone building because it does not have the heating and cooling, the air changes, temperature changes, and the mortar stays dry and you don't have the problems. And so we're really looking at moving back to that. So this is our, um, the salon that used to be in there. We basically use that as our um, meeting area and boardroom area. And then the rest of the building, we had a, a tenant using it for rental space for a little while while we were in process of construction. And now they're clearing out so we can start our grant process. Um, this is one of the ways we've moved our organization forward. We've done gotten some grants for a walking action plan and a food forest to help use the grounds around the school and our buildings to get it to be a part of the community and make it valuable to them, even though they're, we're not inside the building yet. And so that's some ways we've engaged the community. Um, we also made sure to, to explain to the community why this is such an important um, thing economically and for community development. I've seen um, presentations from Bobby App and Donovan Ripkema and really did a, a deep dive on all of that to really sell it to my community as to why this investment would be the best dollar for dollar at the end. In South Dakota, our number one export <laughs> is agricultural products. And it actually creates more work, more jobs to invest in rehab than it does in ag, <laughs> which is really interesting. Um, of course, these are all probably numbers you've seen if you've read any of the stuff that Place Economics has put out, all of the reasons why these buildings are more important to invest in, especially these Sioux Court site ones, because the cost of building them, like if you look at 30 to $35 million replacement on that school, that building will last another 100 years on a renovation, whereas some of the schools today are costing, the Pipestone school they built costs $30 million and it's at the end of its lifespan after 20 years, pretty, pretty much. Like they're having to start thinking about updating remodel. So that just goes to show why the investment lasts you a lot longer. It might be a little bit more expensive upfront, you think, but in the long run, it ends up paying. So we've been really selling that story. In a small town, it's hard because you don't have a lot of resources, so it's hard to sell that. But we are close to Sioux Falls, and we do have a lot of alumni from around the country. We probably have thou like several thousand donors. We have about 
through two to 300 community sponsors because we do a lot of silent auctions and things. And they're really good about donating and helping us move forward. So we're really working on creative adaptive reuse, like some of these projects we researched to see how they do it, the ways they fund it. Um, the, in, the Smiley Building in particular uses a lot of energy efficiency. They've been able to put solar panels in, geothermal. We're looking at alternative things like that to help keep these costs down in renovating and keeping these buildings sustainable for long term. So um, right now, the approximate cost that we've had in seven years, about $16,000 annually to mothball and maintain all of this, which goes to show even a small town like ours, you can invest a little bit of just consistent preventative maintenance and you can save those buildings that would cost a million dollars to tear down. And we haven't even spent that in seven years taking care of it. And um, these are some of the products that we've been making from our artists and volunteers to help fundraise money and also wears awareness in Sioux Court site. You can see the previous owner had taken some chalkboards out in the building because he was going to turn it into assisted living apartments and he broke a lot of them. So, you know, making lemonade out of lemons, we decided we're going to cut them up and make nice little chalkboards for our alumni with chalk rails and everything to take home as a memento, as a piece of the school that they went to and raise some money. And so one of our other board members makes these weather rocks so you can put them outside and you know, it's kind of a funny joke, but like if it's moving, it's windy. If they're if it's wet, it's raining type of deal. So they use the court site for that. And then on the right hand side, um, one of uh, his grandson actually works at the quarry still, and they found buckets of these tiny little um, cubes. And so what he did as an idea is they have these little squares that somebody cut, and one of the guys at the quarry was oh just chuck them. They're just waste. They were just practicing cutting or doing something. And he thought, well, that's about the right size as a dice. So he stuck them in a tumbler and we started making tumbled dice. And so it takes a diamond bit. He can do about six dice with one diamond bit because um, when they're drilling through Sioux Court site, you have to use one diamond bit per foot. That's how hard it is. And so um, we do these dice sets and sell them to raise money and, and give people a new idea of like something that can, it can be used for. So it's pretty cool. Um, and let's see. So this is um, kind of just uh, some of the other things we've done to raise money. We've done um, a 0.5K race around the school. We've done pancake breakfast. We've done drive up meals. Um, we've done, um, uh, we did a vendor fair and um, flea market and stuff. We had a, an auction and stuff. And so we've done a lot of really interesting creative things. We did a, we do a classic car cruise in every summer for their um, town celebration. And that's always a big turnout. And uh, we've just had a lot of really great partners as well. Um, we've worked with the Lions Club in town is very active. The court center club is they do all of the alumni stuff, really wonderful. And a lot of them are also on historical society board. There's a lot of crossover. So you see a lot of the same people in a town of 600 doing the same things. Um, I've worked with a lot of the other organizations have been pushing with the friends of the Casey Jones trail to help get more traffic through our area from Island as they develop that, because we want to be included on that. And so we are looking, we have committees where we are planning the historic trade school, planning arts and crafts um, for our grant all the marketing fundraising, our walking history tours that we're doing with the Pipestone County Historical Society. And then of course, building maintenance, which is one of our biggest things we have volunteers come in and provide in-kind donations or have their time or labor when we buy materials. And that's helped us. Um, this is one of the sad parts of my story is that when I left Jasper and went to Pipestone, this was the other building that was sold to the same owner, did not reach the same fate as mine. Um, this building was about 160 to 200,000 square feet. Uh, I've heard differing amounts. I thought it was 160. The last article I read was said about 200,000. Um, and it was demolished about, yeah, 2019. That was my, <laughs> actually, I'm standing there. That was my, the year it was, it was actually being torn down in that picture behind us. Um, we were there for our reunion and it was kind of our last hurrah. So that's kind of sad to see that right across from the courthouse in Pipestone just be demolished. And it could have been an amazing apartments, business, incubation. I mean, there were so many things that could have been done if it had been on the national register, if it had gotten some grants, gotten a new roof. I mean, just sad. So we also had the opportunity to, to do some historic tax credit advocacy. Obviously, being in Minnesota and not South Dakota is very advantageous because of the tax credit. We do not have that in South Dakota. This project would not be possible three miles over the border. Um, in Sioux Falls, there's a lot of court state buildings, but it's they, a lot of them got raised. And so um, I really like this quote where small towns can't afford to not celebrate every asset they have. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, here's some other pictures of some of the spaces in the building. And uh, that's one of my favorite rooms here would be the um, original 1939 science lab. You can see the built-in cabinets on the end. And then on the right top, there's the chemical hood that still exists. So we have some really unique spaces in the building. And then here is Bauman Hall. And I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Alicia. And I, I'm just going to go through and, and give you a little bit more uh, of the fun stuff that we found when we were working on our condition assessment for Bauman Hall and historic structures report for uh, uh, the school. Uh, 
I think what the Bauman Hall looked like in the forties, most of its life, it was a, it was a general store and then became a, a, a senior center after they rehabbed it. That's what it looked like in 79 when they applied for a, a uh, you know, put it on the national register and, and they did a pretty good job after that of restoring the original looking uh, uh, storefront windows there. So that's what it looks like today. Uh, first floor, pretty, pretty well used. And, and a lot of the, besides for that beautiful tin ceiling is, uh, been stripped of a lot of its historical uh, artifacts in the front, but because the, uh, the second floor as a performance space went out of use, uh, went, yeah, in 39, when the, the school built their giant auditorium, uh, after that, it didn't get used that much. So a lot of the original features are still up there. Um, so just thought I'd talk a little. And then the basement is very basement-y, but it does have a, uh, uh, a brick, brick vault that we were able to find some, this is a good place to find clues, is the, the form liner on the top of the vault where they poured the concrete still has some ads from the original Holvig Brothers store from, I think they were burned down in 1906 and caused them to need to move this building from North Sioux Falls. So we found the ads from that store and we found a newspaper article with a headline that said, Ustrid's appeal, narrow, bigoted, and ill-advised. And I tried to figure out what all that meant, but uh, it was a very sort of Byzantine uh, uh, row down there in Sioux Falls or Sioux, yeah, area. But but it was able to determine that that all happened in June of uh, 20 or not 1910. So we know that, you know, that was not built before 1910. So that's always a good clue to find old newspapers. Um, and here are the ante rooms on the side of the stage. And, and after they did their graduation ceremonies or, or performance came through, they would all sort of etch or, uh, you know, write their names on the, on the side of those uh, buildings there or on the rooms. And uh, just a really interesting thing to read. And you can see the dates of 35. Uh, and interesting conundrum, because this is definitely something we'd like to preserve, but it's all uh, etched in asbestos uh, containing plaster. So one of the things we did in, in our design documents is try to figure out a way to sort of encapsulate that so you could still appreciate it without actually working on it, because you can't really work on things that contain asbestos. Um, and uh, one interesting story that Alicia told me was that uh, she was able to sort of track down some of the people's names that she found in here and hit them up for money. So if you ever find something like this, it's a great resource. So you just got to get a hold of the uh, Roundy Squarey clan and uh, and see if they've got deep pockets. Another interesting thing about this is is you can still see the gas uh, gas pipes for the stage lighting, which is still there. Pretty interesting. Just a couple other interesting features here is I think this building was moved in 1908, 1910. Uh, there wouldn't have been any motion pictures at that point, but we did find this little projection room that they added above the stairs. You can see the projector screen um, uh, holes there. And, and they, because early film was extremely flammable, uh, they encased the whole thing in sheet metal. So I guess just the guy who's running the projector screen gets baked and nobody else. Uh, the other terrifying thing about this photo is that they are running their um, uh, knob and tube wiring right through the very conductive material. Uh, so. One more thing, uh, just to amaze you about how any building survives for a hundred years. Uh, Notice when we were doing our assessment, this big char mark on one of the doors in there. And I was like, what the heck is that from? And you open the door and this lines up exactly with uh, one of the ports for the gas lights. So you know, it's amazing it didn't burn down a hundred years ago. <laughs> um, obviously, I think Alicia already talked a little bit about some of the structural issues we found. Uh, just a little another preservation comes at you fast moment. Uh, in September of 2019, when we did our assessment, we obviously noticed this giant uh, uh, bowl or you know, a structural problem here. And then about a year later, she called us and said, our building's falling apart. Um, and amazingly, it stayed like that, floating with stones floating in air for a, a good year and a half until we were able to secure, you know, finish our design and secure funding to do the repairs. But there's a little touch and go there for a while. Um, you know, it's, I would like to tell you this is this is exceptionally uh, uh, complicated, but it really, it's not. Uh, you know, you basic it's it's expensive and it's hard work and it's tough to get people to drive four hours to go do the work. But you know, you basically just got to put it back together. <laughs> and you know, we do some structural things to make it stay together a little better. The big thing on this is that they had originally they had had the gutter lying on top of the uh, 
on top of the wall for some reason. And obviously, if you don't touch that for 40 years, then you've got problems uh, and water just pours down into your thing. So we did fix that detail a little bit and at least brought the gutter out to sit proud of the wall. So it just pours down the wall instead of pouring into the wall in the future. Um, and uh, I'll just talk a little bit about the Jasper School, probably go through this kind of fast. But uh, what I really love about this building is it, is it tells you three really interesting things about uh, as you look at it. And, and it tells you about the growth of the community. It tells you about uh, changing architectural styles and the way that uh, changing ideas of pedagogy is involved in, you know, the architecture. And, uh, and, and it tells you a good story about the construction industry and the use of such a prominent local material as, as Jasper Stone. As you can see, this is the 1911 school, big, massive stone pile. Uh, and, and that's the original 19, for some reason, still a little unclear to me, 1893, they built this big stone building and then less than 20 years later decided to build a slightly bigger uh, stone building. But, you know, as you'll see, they had no issue with doing additions later. So I'm not sure why they didn't just add on to that. But anyway, so that's, this building is still there, but, uh, and that's what it looked like was done. Another interesting feature is they've got these weird awning windows. I, they all look like big giant uh, double hung windows, but they're actually these awning windows. It was, it was kind of interesting. I've never seen that before. And just to look at the classrooms, what you would have had at a school in, in 1911, basically generic classrooms. Uh, they have a, a library, an office, and uh, something called a labor room, which as far as I can tell, maybe was a teacher's lounge. Um, and that's what students look like in 1911. Looks a lot like students today, but, and Alicia tells me that that's exactly what the school's rooms looked like when she was there, but I bet she had a different desk. Yeah. Um, and because in the 90s, they, they uh, mothballed the third floor for code reasons, uh, the third floor of the building still has a lot of the original features and a, a lot of the original code. So that's, uh, that's that was her mom's uh, office. Yep, there she go. And just some of, this was the high school room. This was uh, sort of the most ornate room. It had cove ceilings, only one like that, and biggest room in the original school, and just some of the crazy conglomeration of materials that they used to make this. Um, 1939, they got a grant from the Public Works Administration to do a, a very common addition. Every building that I, every school that I've been in in Minnesota that has been around this long has one of these gym slash auditoriums in it. Um, and this one is no different. Uh, I just like showing the sheet because it's so such a beautiful drawing. They didn't, even with the index looks great. We don't quite go to that artistic detail these days. Uh, it's, it's much more asymmetrically composed. Uh, it, it's got, you know, it still kind of looks fortress-esque, especially now that they've taken some of the nice cast iron work off, which still exists in town, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's quite aesthetically considered. And I, I like showing this photo because those architects, uh, Perkins and McKay is from South Dakota, is the architect that did the 1939. WWE Green is the original building, I should say. Uh, they did an interesting job of, of making the original building uh, 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 be uh, copacetic with their building. They took off the cupola on the top. They uh, replaced the, the cornice with a sort of a red cast stone band. And then they put all brand new windows throughout the whole thing to make it all sort of a uniform, which is, which is an interesting thing to do. Uh, and some of the interesting thing you get with the thirties is, you know, you use the progressive era, you get uh, more, uh, you know, specific manual training type spaces like domestic science, drafting, you've got, obviously you have a gym and an auditorium now, and you've got big locker rooms um, and some generic classrooms on the second room or second floor. And then that lab laboratory that uh, Alicia told you earlier, uh, just some more pictures of the gym and the auditorium, uh, laboratory, hallways, some of the few existing uh, original chalkboards with the cork boards uh, above and beside. In the 50s, you get a very 1950s edition. Uh, this is by uh, Harold Spitznagel and Associates out of Sioux Falls, and they're still there today as TSP. And I, I really love this edition. You know, that you can tell that they they wanted to do a very sort of international style influence, flat, horizontal, uh, single story edition. And uh, with this one kind of nice airy connector between the two buildings. Um, but, and they had the whole thing drawn up with face brick, which you still see on the inside. But at some point along the way, somebody said, wait a minute, we, we can't do that. This is Jasper. We have to have uh, Jasper. So quartzite on the outside. So they went back and redid the whole building or, you know, did the whole building in Jasper's fieldstone. And I just, or Jasper's quartzite. I know that 
this must have rankled the architects because everything in the mid fifties was, was supposed to be light and airy and contemporary. And, and, you know, it just, it gives it a much, much heavier appearance to have it based with Sioux Fort but it blends very well with the other building uh, in that regard. And, and it's a really unique building in that because you very rarely see a masonry building like this uh, in, in, with such a sort of international style uh, vocabulary. The other thing I love about this building, and this is the band edition, you've got a band and chorus room now, you've got an ag lab and an ag classroom and, and practice rooms for the band students. Uh, and, I, and I can just hear the architects thinking, oh, cool, it's, 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 it's music, uh, it's acoustics, we gotta make everything like slanty lines and not straight uh, anymore. So really, you know, whether or not that it was acoustically uh, advantageous, it gives it much more of a sort of space age 1950s look, which is really fun. This is one of those slanted walls with a absorptive material here and a reflective material there uh, that's just plywood uh, and then some of the interior hallway there. This is the band room with a sort of angled wall in the back and angled ceiling. Must have been pretty live in there because at some point they did have to come by and cover the plywood with uh, with with acoustical tile and, and drapes in the back. Yeah, uh, and then just some interesting uh, original casework in the ag lab, light airy space there as well. Um, and then they built a, a really neat uh, ag shop, uh, almost seamlessly, uh, same architect in 1960 on the end there, which is a really neat space. Currently does have a tenant. Uh, big, you could, you could do this, anything with this space. It's, it's really lovely. It'd be good for brewery, whatever. Uh, it's, it's a neat space. Uh, it's still, you know, they took some of the, starting to get a little more expensive to use this stone though, because they, they have notes here to remove it off of this side and carefully place it on the other sides, but they didn't try to make the mistake of facing this with brick. So you get to 1965 and, and the, this addition is very much characterized by getting as much space as possible for as little money as possible and do a great job of making it uh, blend in with the original building there on the left. Uh, not a lot of uh, aesthetic consideration with the 1965 edition, except they did match the brick here on the exterior with the interior brick they used in the 1956 edition. So I'll give them that. Uh, and you get a general sciences build uh, room here, home ec room, a big shot, nice sh double height shop space, uh, a really big, nice library, uh, typing and bookkeeping room, and uh, business and business practice room, which is interesting. And then you see in the original drawings for this, they do have it faced in stone, but you can see where the uh, bread is buttered on this one, and they had to remove that during construction to save. You said thirty thousand dollars they saved to get the, rid of the stone, so that's where you lose your stone. This is nineteen sixty-five. Uh, just some looks at the the interior spaces there. Uh, that's the library. And uh, I will say, you know, I, I'll just keep this short, but, you know, there are many challenges with this building and uh, and uh, I think we gave her an estimate of, you know, $4 million just to stabilize it and, and get it to a space where you could start to think about reusing it. It's, the size is the big, the big issue here. I mean, you've got uh, what I calculated is a 62,000 square foot building and uh, uh, I, I did a quick occup occupancy calculation on just the first floor. Uh, just using the uh, uses that are there now. And I came up with a occupancy of 967 uh, occupants and the population of the town of Jasper is 601. So uh, you could very comfortably fit the entire town of Jasper uh, inside of it and probably island down the road too. Uh, and so, so how do you reuse a building that is of this size? It, obviously it's so important to the community, but, but I mean, that's, that is, I think the primary challenge with this. Uh, so I'll let uh, Alicia come back and talk a little bit about what they plan on doing in the future. And then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, so I'll just wrap it up here and kind of tell you what we're going to be doing. So, um, you know, access as far as um, one of the other things we've talked about a lot is like um, handicap accessibility is one of the biggest considerations. And when you can see with the levels he was showing you how difficult it is with stairs up and down in the mid-century level um, and different levels and different additions. It's, it's very difficult to think about where you put elevators or ramps and things in this building. So that's going to be one of the challenges we'll have. So one of the things that we're doing to position our organization to move it forward, um, we got just got a recently got a programming grant. And this is the first, most of our grants and our fundraising has been all for um, just construction or stabilizing mothballing proper maintenance. Um, because preventing these problems is way cheaper than letting them get worse down the road. So that's what we're really trying to do. We're trying to develop a strategy so that we can share this. And this is not just for our organization, that we can develop um, uh, guidelines and things that other organizations can do in small 
towns to to think outside the box of how they can accomplish these large projects. And you think you have to have all these big money in this big develop, and you don't. Everything has to happen incrementally with investment from the community. They have to be a buy-in. And the more diverse and the more wide your support base is, the more stable your organization will be. Don't go looking for the big donor here, big donor there, because they're not going to be always sustainable. And you know the control and the like, the, the stuff that kind of comes with that sometimes isn't worth it. So you're better off just speaking to the people who really care about the community, really care about what's going on, want to be involved, even if they're not from there, they move there, they care about what's going on, give them opportunities to see why, how can we make this community better? How can we use this building to solve many other problems? Because it was the center welcoming place of the community. When it closed in 2002, one of the former um, uh, board uh, school board members was quoted as saying something to the effect of, this school has been the heartbeat of the community for nearly 100 years and the heartbeat just died. And this is this is a tragedy because how many people were working there and there every day coming into town to spend money at the grocery store, buy gas. People don't think about that when a school closes in a town like that, everything else starts to dip. To disappear. And so it's not intentional, it just happens. And so there was a little hard feelings because there was three votes before we see and seed. So the town has had a little um, feelings of being kind of taken advantage of, or, you know, just negative feelings about like what all happened. And the school, they were promised we were always going to keep a school there. And then six years later, they said, we don't have the money, we're going to bond $850,000 to tear it down when the historical society director said, no, no, no. So that's kind of the, the background we're coming into. So how do we engage these people? How do we get them to understand that it's not this whole, oh, it's been sitting there for so long. Nobody's going to do anything. It's too much. It's too much money. It's too big because it is an elephant. But my first thing I said at one of the community meetings was, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, one wing at a time, one room at a time. Start with the roof, start with the gutters, start with the windows. And that's what we did. So we started with the most logical things. We're following the strategy. As we make a little money, we invest it into the next most common sense project. And um, so getting this $25,000 grant, working with the Department of Public Transformation, we are establishing the Reclaim Community Art Guild to activate Bauman Hall. The entire goal is to be a part of this cohort, to, to have the money to pay artists to come and teach classes so that artists can learn in our area. And then you can also learn how to be business, have their artist businesses and do things right in their community. You don't have to drive half an hour to Sioux Falls or 45 minutes they can do things there and and it can be a welcoming place for the community like it used to be because it's been closed. People haven't been in it since 1994, pretty much. 96, I think, is when they the city kind of washed their hands of it. And so I hadn't been in it for years. I'd never been on the second floor ever when I bought the building. So it was just like a time capsule. So getting people in here is really exciting. Um, we have been inviting people to sign up for our newsletter because we're right in the process of now planning out the next two years of classes and things. We're starting with some painting and um, I'll be teaching some upholstery and then we're gonna be doing some wood window finishing classes because the biggest thing about these buildings is um, in-kind donations, labor, volunteer. And if you can use strategies like Bob Yap does with his preservation school and have classes, teachers come in, teach people, you have more people in your area who are able to do that work, do it on their own homes and buildings, but also come and help you. And then you move that project forward because then you can spend more of the money on the materials or on the planning documents and the things that you really need. And you can have community really pitch in. And that's been how we've made a lot of progress forward. Um, again, here's some all of the some of the research that we've talked to Bobby App about consulting on turning our, our school into a large arts and historic trades institute because there's nothing in the five state area like that. We are half an hour away from two um, modern vote vocational schools that teach modern carpentry, but nobody's teaching the historic stuff. And if you have these buildings and they need the historic um, trades worked on and there's like a double vacancy rate in those jobs than there is in regular construction, we need to fill that gap and we need to make sure that we're thinking about the long-term sustainability because there's buildings like this all over the state of Minnesota, all over other places that are in this process right now of being demolished or being abandoned and or still languishing that can be repaired with the right amount of investment and strategy. And so um, basically just to wrap it up, the reason why I do it is obviously legacy and family and stuff. And one of the mentors I had, Jerry Peterson was probably the most influential. And uh, one of her men, uh, mentees at the Historical Society was quoted as saying, there are courtside buildings at the cornerstone of this community, obviously. There's, I think, at least 13 full courtside buildings in town and a few others that have foundations. And we like to think of Geraldine as the cornerstone of the history of it because this woman was um, orphaned at the age of nine. Her parents went into the tuberculosis sanitarium in Worthington at four, um, contracted it from a country school dipper. And she was able to visit them for four years before they passed, but she was orphaned and was raised by her grandfather and her uncle, Aaron Straw, who was the quarry master. And so when she was interested in history at a young age, he started encouraging her and say, if you don't document it, who will? So she wrote, by the time um, I, I 
nominated her for a couple of history awards. She won the Minnesota Alliance of History Museums, a Lifetime Achievement Award for four years of work. And she um, had written over, I think about 40, compiled about 40 historical documents. And, they, and she has collected every single edit or uh, edition of the Jasper Journal that was ever printed. And she was actually the female editor from 1970 to 77 which you know, previous to that was a man. So it was really interesting. And she just did an amazing work. She, she told me when she they was given that building by the Historical Society in 1981 to fill with all of her treasures, there was nothing but a rug on the floor and it's two stories full, just packed full that she herself got. So um, when you have people like that in your community, that's what makes these projects possible. The people, go to the people who are caring about the history, go to the people who have been there, who, who know the stories and sometimes nobody's listening to them, but you listen to them and we became fast friends. And I, I sad I only got to know her for five years. She passed away in 2019 of a stroke, but wonderful uh, to meet her. And my sister also passed away two years ago. Um, she went to school in this building with me and my sisters have been very big supports of this. She was always, even though she was ill a lot, she was always coming to fundraisers or donating or very encouraging. And so, um, and that's a picture of my daughter wearing one of the old basketball jerseys from Jasper that I got when the school closed in 93, my mom saved, the, they gave some of the students and teachers and stuff first um, dibs at them. And she got me some of that, some of that stuff that she, I didn't think I would care about at the time because I hadn't been in sports yet. I was only 13, but later on it mattered. So that is pretty much the end. So if you have questions, we're happy to answer. And I do have I do have some like numbers of as far as like um, expenses and stuff. So if there's more detailed questions or later, if you want to reach out to me and kind of tell you where that breakdown is, I can tell you as, as a specific just overall in seven years, um, we have raised in private donations $78,000. Fundraisers have brought in $50,000 and, and change. Our total is $176,600. And the grants we have received not just from, but a lot from the Minnesota Historical Society has been um, $329,000. And then we have that $25,000 programming grant on top of it. So that's kind of how we've been able to move this project forward and take care of that much space. So, yeah. yes. Yeah, um, somewhat. I, I actually did compile a lot and I've been working on a spreadsheet for some of the ones released for our building. It's hard to know, like everybody's buildings are different and what you're doing with them are different. So sometimes, you know, they're not exactly, um, not, you don't always qualify for everyone, but like looking at it, you know, the ones from the Minnesota Historical Society have obviously been the most important for us just because of the building stabilization and the structural stuff. But there's a, like, we are actually looking at um, some of the foundations, like the Jeffress Foundation or some of those that organizations that have grants and, and support for like administrative stuff and programming and like growing organization, which is really hard to find because usually you get a lot for like a project or stuff like that, but you don't get it for um, that administrative or that other, you know, doing like a capital campaign and stuff in a couple of years. So, so there's stuff out there. I do have some, and I do have a, a resource list on our website, um, reclaimcommunity.org, which has, um, if you go in the blog, there's like a three page summary of all of the research that I basically read over the seven years of like the greenest building report, um, summarizing a lot of place economics research, um, summarizing some of the stuff from the Department of Defense, the Bloomberg um, study on the New York City buildings and the energy efficiency audit that they did in the 90s. Um, and so there's a lot of information historically that we have. It's just, I don't think a lot of people dive into it that much or get as nerdy about it as I do. So if you wanna go to my website and there's that resources there and I'm happy to you know exchange information if there's any specific ones that you have questions about that I've looked into, because there's a lot, you know. Uh, reclaimcommunity.org and part of the reason why we named it that is you know the whole idea of reclaiming resources using um reclaimed materials and reclaiming community pride at the same time so that's kind of how we came up with that name yeah that is an excellent question um luckily our board member terry skyberg is a skyberg construction he had already befriended the owners of these buildings. He's worked on several buildings. He's been in Jasper and graduated from the school. And so he's been there since it started. And so he, um, even though he's not trained in historic trades and he went through like the school and got his, and then he did an apprenticeship, um, he still has learned by working with a lot of the old craftsmen on these buildings and knowing all the quarry workers and the old contractors of how to do a lot of that building, building work and how to take care of these buildings in more of a historical way, if that makes sense, but he also had adapted to a lot of the new stuff. So it's been a, a learning process. We've had to reach out way outside of our region. Like even in Sioux Falls, we don't have a lot of people who can do that work. So the city's pretty much, um, we had to have equity builders come down. 
Yeah, you can, you can, maybe you have more experience with yeah, multiple so, buildings. So when we do our design documents, because it's grant funded from the state, we have to put those out to bid. So we will prepare a set of bid documents and then uh, we advertise them on a, through a plan room online and, and we help uh, them take care of all that. Uh, and then, you know, contractors bid on the work and then they select the contractor that if you're lucky, comes in under the uh, budget that you have. But these days that's harder and harder to do. Uh, but it's a it's basically just a typical bit and it is difficult because of where this place is located uh most of the contractors that we get are from the twin cities and so it's a long it's four hours to get down there so it's it's tricky to find people that are you know even interested in bidding on the work let alone ones that will come in and under budget it's a it's a challenge uh, so equity builders is who we've worked on with this project they're looking on the other project that i mentioned in uh, ferris grand block ferris grand block and they they have a mason that does pretty good work but uh it, it is a challenge does that answer your question? Okay. I, I will say that actually is part of the reason why we're looking at the trade school option for this building because the best, I believe the best use of it is to make it into a school again of a different sort. And we don't have arts and historic trades stuff around here. And if we were to train more people and a lot of the kids coming out of the Votech, we're able to have a second entire, you know, they can do modern construction, but they also can come and do historic stuff. It just gives them a whole nother opportunity to be entrepreneurial, there's thousands of historic homes in, in Sioux Falls, but there's not a lot of historic investment in South Dakota. So there is a market for it because people don't realize that it's so much more, much of a better investment to put your old windows back and restore them in your home than it is to put a vinyl in and, you know, the lifespan and stuff. But it's just people aren't aware of that, especially across the border. So we're so close to South Dakota. And I think people, as you get closer there, they it's, it's poor. It's one of the poorest counties in Minnesota. And so the resources are hard. Finding the trades people are hard, which is why we need to train people in our area to be able to do this and, and start to continue to perpetuate that because we're gonna lose these trades if we don't. And so that's why. Yeah. On the, which building? Um, the school, so right now we're working on, um, they are working on the architectural plans for the roof. We're gonna replace the roof in the gym. Uh, that's great. We didn't really touch on that too much, but that's why we have, um, uh, we just got a $10,000 grant this spring and we decided to fund the other 14,000 because we didn't want to wait for the large grant round and just, you know, that because next year we, and then spring, I, we were going to apply for the entire gymnasium 1939 wing to be replaced because that locker room is failing. It's on the lower level, the first floor. And then the gym obviously has some um, problems because we really want to get that wing open first. We want to have a, um, the community in there. We want to do events and parties and movies and all this. I mean, Geraldine, before she passed, said her dream was to stand on the stage and see it lit up like it used to be and I, I was really hoping that that would happen for her but unfortunately not uh but we have like the back grounds we can open the back doors of the gym we can project movies on the back wall and it's a beautiful like auditorium area so we really see like even putting up like a pop-up skate park we've talked about in the gymnasium there's kids who travel for traveling basketball teams and we had a parent even say wow if we could use this gym right here we wouldn't have to drive down to Harrisburg to practice which is like another hour away because there just aren't a lot of places for kids to do stuff in the winter there's four high schools that drop off in town and kids are bored and we have had some vandalism issues. We've had to put security system in and stuff. So we really want to get this building used. We want to, and so that's the goal. We're just working on the gym right now and mop on that. So any other questions before we end? <laughs> I think it's getting close to lunch too. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if there's another question, I mean, you can welcome to come up and chat with us or exchange information if you have more questions. But if you want to dash off to lunch, he said they'll be setting up a little early so you can head right out to the buffet as well. So if you want to look at my, uh, our end of our like little dice, you can kind of see the differences in the color. I mean, you can kind of even tell there's two dice here that were from the original batch that, that are, contractor found at the quarry that was it was just a bucket that was sitting back in the corner from who knows how long ago and then just recently they cut a whole bunch of more squares so you can see the pale pink of the new ones versus the reddish pink of the old ones <laughs> so just kind of funny how it changes so 